previous in lecture, we talked about a way of trying to describe the strength of the force of an electrically charged object. Uh, we usually call this the electrostatic force. Static just because nothing is moving around, and electro because we're dealing with electric charge. And we said how we could actually try modeling this based on very similar to what we see with the equations of gravitational force. And that has been fairly useful because we see there's a lot of things in common. For one thing, it depends on the size of the masses involved, the distance apart, and some sort of constant up front. With the gravitational force, it's the big gravitational constant. And even though it's written with a big G, it's actually a very small number, at least with the unit system that we happen to use. And with the electric force, again, it's very similar. You have a multiplication of the two different charges involved, their separation, and a sort of multiplicative constant. Uh, the way I wrote the constant here is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. That is going to actually be similar to another value you've seen, and you're going to see often as k, as the constant being used. 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, they are the same. And epsilon naught is supposed to represent the um, permittivity of free space, of the vacuum. In a sense, you could say how difficult, quote unquote, it is to go uh, for an electric uh, charge-like thing to go through just pure vacuum. We'll be coming to this sort of constant later when we talk about capacitors. But in the meantime, we see that the two forces involved here are modeled almost identically. Uh, and this is the case when we're dealing with basically point charges or things that are just spherically symmetric for us and we're outside of them. But we want to now move on to another interesting topic. So it's easy to measure force, for example, how heavy something is, and you can say something about the gravitational force. Uh, you're exerting so many newtons to lift up a box. And we can do the same thing with electric force, but we want to now look at to a different concept. So instead of thinking about two objects, what if we could think about the effect from just one object? Well, if we take out the second objects here, then we really can't possibly use these force equations because it's supposed to be a multiplication between two charges. And if you don't have two charges, well, what's the point? Same thing with gravity. If you don't have two masses, you can't talk about a gravitational force. But could we still try to talk about as if something were there? So we're going to introduce a new concept here known as the field. So for now, we're going to move these particular force equations out of the way and try to bring in a new concept. So we're trying to think about the idea of just a charged object or just a mass alone in space just by itself and trying to describe what's there when only that one object is there. When it comes to the equations, it's well, there's an easy way that we could possibly try to model something like that. Let's, for example, take the gravitational force in this uh, setup. What if we were to take the gravitational force and just divide out the contribution from a second mass, the little m? Well, if we just plug that into our equation, we get negative g, big M, r squared. And we are still talking about vectors here, so let's include the vector portion. And we see now we can actually possibly talk about something just by this simple division. And we don't have to worry about a second mass at all, as long as we define this uh, force divided by mass sort of thing. So what would that sort of thing look like? Now, now you might be thinking in this case, well, since we remember Newton's second law, F equals MA, if you took force and divided it by mass, you get acceleration. But we're talking about in a case where there really isn't a force on an object. It's just the object itself. So there's nothing to even produce an acceleration. And technically, also, we're talking about with uh, Newton's second law, that's supposed to be the sum of forces on an object. Remember, it's sum of the forces or the net force equals mass times acceleration. So we're just talking about this one object on its own and really no force acting on it because it's all on its own. So this isn't going to be sensible to just call this acceleration in that sort of way. So let's get rid of that, and let's give it some other new label. And the label that we try to call this then is talking about the gravitational field in this sort of case.
uh, the expression for the gravitational field may not be as familiar to you. And then again, it might. Uh, usually in the textbook, you'll see actually this combination simply called a letter you've probably seen before, little g. Well, that does look like the acceleration due to gravity then. And in that case, you could see that if you just took mass times that gravity, you get the gravitational force. So this already kind of looks a bit familiar to you. But now let's take this idea and put it into a different context, one where it may not look as obvious of what it might be. So we'll put that off to the side for now. And we'll talk about the same sort of thing, but with the electric force. Now, in that case, of course, the electric force is certainly not going to be divided out by mass as it was before. But if we divide that by the little charge, we still get the same sort of effect. Or pi epsilon naught. Charge on its own, r squared, r hat. So we can do the same sort of thing. Now we can try to talk about something with just the one charge on its own. And we can now give it some sort of new term, and we call this the electric field. In fact, we pretty much define it this way. So, what does an electric field actually mean? Well, in the same way with the gravitational field, basically it means if you take a mass, multiply it by the gravitational field constant, then you get the force acting on the object. The same sort of thing here. If you had some sort of charge floating around in space by this other charge, you could use the electric field, multiply that, and you'd get the force. You can see with just a little bit of algebra, we just move this out of the way, we can see that if you take the electric force and multiply it by your little charge Q, you're going to get the electric force. So, we already see that we can make you know, some sense out of this. We can go back and forth between field and force. But here's the thing that's rather curious with the electric field as the way we have it defined then for just a single object. Here's how we have the electric field defined right now. It's 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, test charge size q, r squared, r hat, now here's the thing that's a bit weird. This r squared factor, well, the distance between what? You know, perhaps you could say between the electric charge and what else? We also have a vector sign here. Well, in what direction? As it seems, I mean, because before when we used r, it was from one charge to the other, but now we're only talking about one charge. So the electric field is capturing something rather different than what you're probably used to. It is talking about something being there, when even though there's nothing that actually is there to feel it. As you get farther and farther away from the test charge, when your R value is increasing, then you have this electric field weakening. And also, because of that R hat um, issue, it's going from the charge itself and then radially outward or inward, depending on the sign here. It's also then basically saying that this electric field is in all directions, all places, and its strength changes with distance, but it is everywhere. So if we're actually believing our mathematical formalism here, this is telling us that there is something everywhere from an object that has a very simple singular location. In this case, we want to have at least some way of possibly mapping out what's supposed to be going on. So you've probably seen many pictures of electric field lines, and the, perhaps the most famous thing you've seen is any time you've ever taken a bar magnet and you've put iron filings on there and you see all the filings line up, and you usually say those are along the magnetic field lines. We'll talk about magnetism later, but the same sort of thing is supposed to be going on with an electric field. So in this image taken from your textbook of two different charges, we can talk about the electric field from them. One of these charges is positive, one of them is negative. And the big thing you're going to notice, though, is that in the case of the positively charged object, the arrows are pointing away 
from that charge. Well, what does that mean? With our uh, electric potential, it would say then that if you had a positive test charge, so we had an electric field and you put a positive charge Q there, and we have that positive charge in the middle, that's going to tell us that the force acting on there is going to be positive. It's going to be greater than zero. And what does a positive force mean? That means it's going to be repulsive. It means it's going to push the things away from each other. So again, this is assuming a positive electric charge that you put there for your test charge. Conversely then, if we were to instead look at the negative charge as we have here, we see the arrows are pointing towards the negative charge. So the same sort of thing would happen then if we had an electric field from a negative charge like that, and we put, again, a positive charge Q there. Well, if the electric field is negative, then the force that is going to produce is going to be negative, less than zero, and that means the force is going to be attractive. A positive charge is going to try to move towards the negative charge, which makes sense because we would expect the force between them to be attractive, as we've seen before with our previous experiments and demonstrations. So this is what the lines are going to be representing, that if the arrows are pointing away from the charge, that means if you put a positive test charge there, it'll move away. And if the arrows are pointing towards an object, that means if you put a positive test charge, it's going to be moving toward the object. Now, notice I've been using this word, test charge. Basically, this just means that if we were to imagining there were some sort of charge floating around in space, this is what would happen to it. But we are trying to describe the electric field even general, more generally than that, so even if there isn't a charge there, we can still talk about what would happen if a charge was there or not. So, one other feature you're going to notice is that the distance apart from the various field lines what it's going to tell us is that the closer the lines are together, that means the field is going to be stronger. In the same sort of way, if you've seen a topology map where it's supposed to be showing elevation, when the lines are really close, that means that it's a really steep cliff, and if the lines are really far apart, it's not much of a cliff. The same sort of thing here, as the lines are spreading out, that's basically indicating to you visually that the electric force, or electric field, I should say, is weaker. So those are the sorts of things that the field is already telling us about. But the most important thing is that, that we are trying to describe a field extending from an object that goes out in all directions forever. This is a lot more different than, than just imagining single objects, and if they're separate from each other, then they're not interacting. Usually you think about two billiard balls. Let's imagine that. I mean, if we take a couple of balls out, if we take a couple of balls out, one here, and how about another one here, you're not going to expect any force between them until the two have actually collided with each other. So when the two approach and then bam, hit, that's the only time you'd expect there to be any force, any acceleration from them. Now, you've of course, you know, have experienced the force of gravity, and you notice that you're not touching the Earth, you're holding, for example, um, your book up and you drop it, and even though apparently nothing's touching your book, this thing is falling down. Something is accelerating it, there's some force on it, even though you don't see anything pushing on it directly. This was the sort of thing that already drove Newton a bit nuts because he couldn't explain the gravitational force, and the only way he could get around this is the fact that he kind of also believed in sort of occult things and could be okay with action at a distance, as it was called. And that should be somewhat strange to you, the idea that you don't have to touch something and yet you can affect it. But the field, the electric field, is already describing something that does just that. It's saying the electric field is everywhere. No limit to its size. You don't have to be in contact with it. It's literally filling up all of space. Now, this is, of course, assuming that this is more than just a mathematical formalism, more than just an interesting little trick. And when these sorts of things were first introduced, for example, when Michael Faraday was describing electric and magnetic fields, it was basically something that was kind of a hand-wavy sort of thing. It just helped him explain things, but he couldn't show anything rigorously about it other than the fact that, hey, I can explain some things this way.
But once it starts making predictions that nothing else can, then we start believing it's quite real. Same thing happens with atomic theory and everything else. Originally, it just seems to be some sort of nice abstraction. It helps you get the work done. And then eventually you find out, hey, it's actually more than that. This is really a history of science sort of thing, but you can see it already in, for example, the works of Copernicus. He thought it was real, but um, originally when it was published, his work, his De Revolutionibus, there was an, a, um, a preface added to it that he didn't approve of that basically said, this is just a nice mathematical formalism. It doesn't say anything real about physics. Um, and then, of course, about 100, 200 years later, then everyone's like, yeah, this actually is real physics. So starts from mathematical formalism or what people accept as merely mathematical formalism, and then it goes to the real deal. But so far, the formalism that I'm showing you is only for single particles, things of basically no size, they're point-like, and they just have a charge. Well, we want to be able to deal with more than just one single charge. So we need to add things up a bit. So instead of one charge, we could imagine we have a bunch of charges. We can imagine them of various magnitudes or various sizes. They'll be different distances apart from some given point. So if I were to imagine I was just standing right here and I wanted to figure out what is the electric field at that point, at that point x there, how would I go about it? Fortunately, the electric field is going to be rather simple to calculate in a sense. In the same sort of way that you can imagine the net force acting on an object is just the sum of all the various different forces, the same thing is going to be with the electric field, that all you have to do is add what's the electric field from each individual object. This sort of idea is called the principle of superposition, just adding the effects of everything on top of each other, super meaning just on top. Now, I have to specify this because not all forces behave this way. For example, the strong nuclear force, which we won't be talking about in any detail this semester, does not follow this sort of principle, and so when you want to do rigorous calculations of its effect in the interiors of atoms, well, it's going to take a lot more effort than what you're used to. So we'll step past that for now, but if you go to grad school, be prepared. So we're going to have this nice simple thing where we just have to add the electric field contribution of every little piece. So these are all various charges, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. So if I wanted to find the total electric field at one point, it's just going to simply be the addition of every little bit of charge. So they're all going to have the same multiplicative constant of 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. And I'm just summing up every little charge, every distance they are away from my point of interest squared, and also remember the vector component aspect to it. So, for example, notice how this charge over here is to, you know, generate to the left of that point. Well, this other charge over here is to the right. Now you can imagine if these two charges were, say, of equal magnitude, they were both positive charges, say, and you were in between these two, you would expect basically their forces on you to cancel out in the same way if it were some sort of tug of war and you had two equal forces on you. If you had two equal teams pulling on you, you wouldn't budge. So we do have to worry about this vector component and not simply the sign of the charges. So direction is going to matter, magnitude is going to matter, distance is going to matter, so while it is nice that we can just add up everything together, we also are going to have to be very careful how we add all those things together. Now, adding you know, one or two charges together isn't necessarily too bad. You can, for example, break them into components and add the x and y components separately. And if there's only a few charges, it's not too bad. But we can imagine making this a lot more complicated by having, let's say, um, a mole of charges. So if we're talking, you know, 10 to the 24, 10 to the 26 um, atoms, for example, that many electrons, well, you can imagine doing a sum of 10 to the 26 is going to take you a while and your calculator will probably explode or at least run out of battery life before it completes the addition. So 
We can imagine this, though. In the same sort of way that we can talk about resolution of pixels, if the, the pixels are many enough, small enough, and far away, you can't distinguish the separate pixels. If you have a whole lot of charges all kind of packed together and they're a bit of distance from you, you can't really distinguish the aspects of each individual charge. So you can talk about it continuously rather than as if it were one simple, and say we want to think of it as one simple thing together rather than a whole bunch of little pieces we add together. So instead, let's put that out of the way, and we can make an approximation if we were to imagine there's lots and lots of little charges, they're all really close to each other, then we can say that the electric field instead is treated as a continuous distribution where we're looking at every little dq in some little area and we make that area, that size, as small as possible. That goes to zero. And that sort of limit, we're really talking about a, an infinitesimal. In other words, we're talking calculus. So instead of that sort of infinite sum, or a very large sum, I should say, we could talk about an integral over that. And so we're adding up every little infinitesimal charge, their distance away squared, and of course, the vector component. So in this way, we can talk about a distribution of charge. So in this case, it's basically a matter of setting up the integral, and that is where most of the work is going to be. But this all follows from the principle of superposition and that the fact that our electric charges are very small and compacted together, that you can't distinguish the charges separately unless you have, say, an electron microscope. I don't happen to have one, and as you can guess with your eyes, you cannot resolve separate atoms or electrons. This is going to be not just a good approximation, but so darn good that you will probably never be able to distinguish it without some very, very hefty equipment. But how are we going to talk about a distribution of charge? That will require just a little bit more formalism before we hop into any problems. So let's move this electric field equation out of the way and talk about another aspect. So suppose we have some total amount of charge. So let's say our total amount of charge in some object is Q, big Q for all that charge. Now we could talk about it being distributed evenly over various things. We could say it's evenly distributed across some volume. If we were to do that, if we want to talk about a constantly, or a uh, constant charge density, let's call that a row, we could say that that's defined as the total charge divided by the volume you have. So the bigger the volume, the more it's spread out, the smaller the charge density. And this is assuming a constant charge density. We could actually model this differently if we wanted to, but for simplicity, we'll just start with a constant charge density here for volume. Um, but we could also, instead of having it distributed over an entire volume, we could have it, say, distributed over an entire surface. So, for example, you could imagine you have a hollow copper sphere and you've charged it. So all the charge is just on that outer surface. And we could describe that with the surface charge density. And again, if we're assuming it's of constant charge density, then it's just going to be that charge divided by what is the surface area. All right, and so that's a three-dimensional object, two-dimensional objects we can think of, and we can also do this one-dimensionally. You could imagine then just a wire, a straight wire, and we could talk about its linear charge density with lambda here, and as you can imagine, it's the same sort of thing. It's just how much charge do you have and dividing it by the length of your wire in this case. And so these are going to have, nice. Uh, every little infinitesimal piece is going to have that same charge density, but how much charge you have is going to depend on the charge density and how much of a region you're looking at. So with that formalism, let's now try an actual problem. Let's consider this scenario of the electric field in just the x direction from a wire. And now we've set it up in such a way so that way the wire is all along the x direction, 
and our point of interest is also on the x direction. This will actually make our integration process fairly easy and give us a little bit of a warm up of what we want to do. So a few points to clarify what we have. So we have a rod or a wire of some length L. And we're going to also say that like the tip of that wire is some distance A away from our point of interest of where we're actually trying to measure the electric field strength. And if we want to set up a proper integral, we need to talk about an integration region. So we need to talk about a little charge delta Q. And as I said, it's going to basically depend on two things. It's going to depend on the charge density. In this case, it's going to be lambda because we're talking about linear charge density. And it's going to depend on how big of a region we're looking at. So if we want to look at an infinitesimal region, we're talking about an infinitesimally small piece of length, in that case, our dx. So we have a relationship between an infinitesimal charge region and an infinitesimal length. That'll be important because when we're setting up our integral that we noticed before, it actually depends on the little dq aspect, but we're going to be integrating actually over distances. So how are we going to set this up? All right, let's give ourselves a bit of room for setting things up. So we'll start off again with the definition, and in this case we'll look at an infinitesimal amount of electric field. So before, of course, we define the electric field of any given point as being 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r squared r hat. So if we want to then figure out the entire electric field, we can look at an infinitesimal charge. So we'll look at an infinitesimal amount of electric field and then integrate over that. So if we were to look at, say, an infinitesimal amount of electric field, and we'll just look in the x component for right now. That'll give us 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught dq over x squared, where x is the distance away from our point in the x direction. Now, you might say, okay, let's just integrate. We'll just integrate with respect to q, but the amount of q is going to actually depend on how far you are away from that point. We actually see that from what we wrote before, up here, that there's a relationship between the charge, dq, and x. So we actually have to put that into our equation here so we can actually do a proper integration here. So if we do integrate both sides and plug in what we need, we're going to find then that the electric field, again, in the x direction, is going to be the integral 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught lambda dx over x squared. Now, we have an integral, so we need integration limits. So that's going to be basically where the beginning of the wire that has charge is, and then to the end. So we're going to actually be starting from distance a away from that point. That's where the wire begins, and it goes all the way along the length of the wire. The end of the wire is not distance l away from that point, but distance l plus a. So now this is just a setup for a nice little bit of an integration. This shouldn't be too bad. Um, dx over x squared, that's the same as um, x to the minus 2 dx. So if you remember chain rule, you know that's actually a fairly easy integral to do. So let's take care of that and get that out of our way. But we should make a little bit of space. You know, we're getting a little bit cramped here. So we see that this sort of integral is something we can do. So we're going to get 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Lambda, lambda is a constant, so we can take that into integration. And our integral, we're going to get a result of 1 minus, or uh, negative 1 over x. And we have our integration limits a and l plus a. So we're going to just plug those in, and that's not too bad so far. And I'm also going to now replace lambda 
with its definition. Remember we said that lambda, the linear charge density, is equal to the entire charge divided by the length of wire that we are going over. So if I do that, I'm going to get Q over 4 pi epsilon naught, 1 over the length, and then multiplying by what happens when we plug in our limits. When we do that, we get 1 over A minus 1 over L plus A. And if we actually try to add these two fractions together, get common denominators, we're going to actually find a factor of L in the numerator that gets canceled out by that factor of L from the electric charge that I showed before. I'll just make a little bit more space because I like to draw big. Lastly, then, we find that the electric field in the x direction is going to equal the charge in question, how much charge the entire wire has, 4 pi epsilon naught, and multiplied by the fraction of B, or, sorry, that should be A, L plus A. All right, not too bad. So that's the electric field from a wire of length L. But you might ask yourself, what if L was very, very long, but it had the same charge density? Well then, we can actually think about that, and let's make a little bit of space and see what that reveals. So let's go back to our equation that we had before. And I'm going to go back into using lambda again instead of Q divided by L. So in that case, if I go through that and get the integration done right, I'm going to get lambda over 4 pi epsilon naught. And I'm going to then get 1 over A minus 1 over L plus A. Now suppose that this wire was very, very long, but again of constant charge density. Well, if L becomes very, very large, then the fraction of 1 over L plus A is going to go to zero. So this is going to be fine, but that is going to go to zero. In which case, again for L becoming very, very large, going to infinity, the electric field is going to be lambda over 4 pi epsilon naught, 1 over A. That should be interesting to you, and here's the reason why. If the wire is infinitely long, and it's of constant charge density, it has an infinite charge, one would think. And yet, the electric field we're getting is finite in size. Now, you can imagine, of course, that's because every little bit of charge is getting farther and farther and farther away, and so it contributes less and less and less because it's falling off in contribution as 1 over r squared. So in that case, it's actually not that severe an effect, and so we can actually get a finite electric field from something that's actually infinitely long. Um, in physics terms, we tend to say that a wire is long, and by that we mean it's so long we can treat it as infinitely long, and as it's, you saw here, then we can have you know, factors just divide out or just disappear because you have one divided by something that goes to infinity, well, that's zero. So actually, when we do physics problems like this, we like to make all sorts of assumptions that things are large enough we can treat them as infinitely large, and our calculations get a lot easier. But that is the interesting thing, that even with something apparently infinitely big, you can still get a finite result. The only way the electric field could blow up in size is if you were next to the infinitely large wire. If A then were to go to zero, then you'd see that the electric field would explode in size. But we're not going to quite do that. Nonetheless, you see, this is the sort of setup. The most important part is figuring out what is supposed to be your infinitesimal region, setting up your integral, and then being very careful with all of your steps. Now, for that previous problem, we had to consider things only basically in one dimension, and it was fairly easy in that respect. 
but if we have a more two-dimensional object, we're going to have to be careful because we can expect some parts of the charge surface to actually cancel out. So let's now consider a ring of charge and see where that might lead us. So here now we'll consider this ring of charge. It'll have a radius of A, and we're going to consider a point that is perpendicular to the plane that the circle is in, and we're going to be looking uh, basically just at some distance x away from the center of that circle. This is again something to make our lives actually a bit easier if we want to consider points that aren't quite on that um, uh, x-axis line things will become a bit more fun. So we're just going to keep things simple for this example right now. And the key thing you can see is that basically the contribution at say the top part of the ring is going to have an x and a y component. While at the bottom of the ring it'll also have an x and y component but the two uh, y components are going to be equal, opposite, and cancel things out. So the total electric field we might expect from everything to actually just be completely along the x-axis. So when we go through and we try to model what's happening here, we need to be cautious in our setup. So let's start doing that. Let's give ourselves a little bit of space to work with here. Now we already have a way of then talking about little infinitesimal regions, and again we'll first consider talking about just the electric field in the x direction. So as defined, e in the x direction, and we'll look at just infinitesimal parts of that is going to be 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. The little bit of q and the distance r squared away at that point p that we're looking at. And we are looking at just the x component, so we have to basically take an angular contribution. So sine theta is already defined for that. And we can see that it, the x component of that triangle is going to be cosine of that angle theta. Now, r squared is actually the hypotenuse of a triangle, so we actually see that r squared is supposed to equal a squared plus x squared. a is the radius of the ring and x is the distance we are away from the center of that ring. So we want to actually plug all of that in right now. And if we do that, we're going to find then that the infinitesimal little electric charge, or electric field, is going to be 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught dq cosine theta, all divided by the square, no, no square roots here, sorry, a squared plus x squared. Okay, so far so good. Uh, to continue moving along though, we do want to figure out what we want to do with cosine here because we can see that the angle cosine is dependent on both the size of the ring and how far we are away from the ring. Well, fortunately, we can just do that with a little bit of trig. So, we see that cosine of theta is going to equal adjacent over hypotenuse, that is, x divided by r. And as we defined earlier, that there is a definition for r. It's a, uh, r squared is equal to a squared plus x squared, so we can write this out as x divided by square root of a squared plus x squared. All right, this is starting to look, you know, a little bit more complicated, but we can, you know, we can work through this. We can plug this in then into our equation. And if we do that, we're going to find that the infinitesimal little bit of electric field in the x direction is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. That constant will still hang out with us. Infinitesimal bit of charge divided by how far away we are from that. So that was a squared plus x squared. And then times cosine theta, which we just defined then as x divided by square root of a squared plus x squared. So, we're still not done yet. We want to simplify this a little bit, but not too bad so far. So let's just give ourselves a little bit of space. Move that off, off into the corner. We can still see what we've done so far. And if we do that, we can see that this simplifies out. 
And we find that the x component of the electric field is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. dq times x, all divided by, uh, not maybe not the happiest function you normally see, but is a squared plus x squared to the 3 halves power. All right, so now we could just, you know, take integral of both sides, and we could take integral of dq. Do we need to do anything about relating this to x, like we did before? No, because we actually don't have a relationship between an infinitesimal little bit of x and an infinitesimal bit of charge, because when we set up that previous integral, we had the relationship that dq was equal to lambda dx. We don't have this here now. x is just how far away we are from the center of that circle, and there's no charge along x at all. So in fact, this is going to be a very simple integral. So we'll just take integration of both sides as is. And so when we do that, we're actually going to find then that the electric field in the x direction is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught x divided by our not so nice looking fraction a squared plus x squared all to the 3 halves power and we're doing the integral over dq, the entire charge, so it's just whatever the total charge of this thing is, which is just going to be the total charge, dq, or sorry, big Q like that. So fortunately that integral at the end was nice and uh, easy to do. If we did have to do an integral with respect to x, um, you'd probably want to pull out some trig identities. Remember what you did back in calculus 2 level stuff. So we dodged that bullet fortunately this time. And the reason we did again was because there wasn't a relationship between the little charge density region and the x position. And as I mentioned then, we can see that basically any y contribution from that ring is going to be canceled out by the opposite side of that ring. So in fact, we know we can just look at that and realize that the electric field in the y direction is zip, zilch, nada, multiplied by zero. So a whole lot of nothing. That's an easy setup for that, yes. But of course, if we were to go off of the x-axis at all, then those cancellations aren't... Now, there's one last thing to consider. Now, remember that A was the size of the ring. So, what happens if the ring becomes very, very large? Well, in that case, then the denominator in our electric field equation in the x-direction has one says so x divided by something that's growing up really, really big. So in that case, we'd have nothing, which kind of makes sense. That means that our source of charge is infinitely far away, and it's not going to bother us. Conversely, though, now imagine if A got really, really small, so small that it became 0. If that were to happen, then we could see that we'd actually have x divided by the fraction x squared to the 3 halves, or we'd have x divided by x cubed. Overall, we'd have 1 over x squared. Well, in that case, you would basically just have the electric field due to a particle again. So this thing actually completely reduces down to an equation you do know in those sorts of extremes. And that sometimes is a nice sort of check you can do. If you could just imagine, what well, if this thing gets really big or really small? What sorts of effects does that have? Does it reduce down to something that you already know is, you know, near and dear to your heart? So it isn't necessarily going to tell you that you're right, but it can at least show you that what sorts of things happen in the more extreme cases. Last thing that's also then a bit interesting is if the value of x is zero, that means you're just right in the center of the ring. In that case, it is telling you that you will experience no electric field. That makes sense. You have just as much electric field in front of you as behind you, and uh, above and below you, and all that. And when it comes to then this sort of electric field being zero, what would that mean if you had some sort of charge there, positive or negative? Well, it means it would just kind of sit there. It would be just as attracted in every other direction, and so it would act like there was nothing there at all. So all that can be modeled just from this equation, and that's the sort of thing you could do as a future check.
just imagining what would happen in such a case, and does that make intuitive sense to you in these sorts of cases? And at least for my brain, it seems to be doing that, and you can probably visualize why that would be as well.